So now I want to talk about the origins of codependency. I want to talk to you about where codependency comes from and why um, it happens, because it's not a coincidence. It can be related to specific a specific time in a person's life that is very clear to me and very distinct. But to understand this, I have to, I have to set up a couple of explanations first. First of all, codependency and the emotional manipulator disorders are rooted in childhood. Codependents come from families in which there is an emotional manipulator. And sometimes there's a mental illness, there's abuse, there could be drugs, there can be trauma, there can be all sorts of really damaging, um, damaging backdrop to their childhood. But to every codependent, I promise you, there is an emotional manipulator parent. Now, now I want you to think now. I want you to think whether it's yourself or it's um, one of your clients. Think of a couple codependents. Now think about their parent. Do they have an emotional manipulator parent? They always do. Because codependency can be traced back to the child's um, um, first five years of life, how they coped with the narcissism of the emotional manipulator. So let's first set up why, what, what does an emotional manipulator expect when they have children? Uh, emotional manipulators have, like all narcissists, this idea that a child is going to be there for them. The child's going to make them feel good about themselves. The child is going to heal their own childhood wounds. They're going to finally make them feel good about themselves. They're going to justify their own past and their own mistakes. They're going to right the wrongs of their own childhood. They're going to love this child like they were never loved. This child has so much expectation placed on him or her. This child becomes the literal extension of self to the, to, the, to the narcissist or the emotional manipulator. The child is not loved unconditionally because emotional manipulators cannot love unconditionally. This child is loved when he or she makes the emotional manipulator feel good about themselves. So this child ends up becoming um, the extension of self, the, the gift for the emotional manipulator. Now, for us who are not emotional manipulators, we know children are gift be gifts because they are who they are. They're just perfect when they're born. Now, some are more challenging than others. That is true. But to the emotional manipulator, the, this child is going to make them feel really good. Yes? Actually, I... Actually, I'm going to stop you. Is it, it, let me, there, there is a, I'm sorry, this is my fault because I should have said this to me. There is a flow to the next 20 minutes. And, and so, and, I, and I'll build up to that. And then a lot, and then hold on to your question. And then, I'll, um, and then ask me at the end of it because a lot of information is about to come out. And, and, and your question actually, go, it's a good question. Just, just hang tight to it. And then I have a question that I have to answer. I got a question from my, the, someone from the internet that I want to answer to. So the child is born with expectations. The child is, going, is, is a gift of sorts to this emotional manipulator. The child that can make the emotional manipulator feel good about themselves gets love, gets attention, gets adoration. So this child who can figure out how to adapt, how to make their parent feel good about themselves, is a child who Alice Miller calls in her book the drama of the gifted child, the gift, is the trophy, or is what I call the pleasing child. Because the EMM will neglect or abuse a child that doesn't conform to their needs, that does not make them feel good about themselves. But the child that can, that can figure out a way to make their parent feel good about themselves, gets the attention that they need, which is going to delineate the two paths for the children. One is um, to, uh, as the abused, neglected child, that's going to become the emotional, future emotional manipulator, which we will talk about after lunch, and the child who's going to learn to be this pleasing child, the gift child, the trophy child. Please, EMMs, want to care for their, child, their children. 
they feel whole and competent when their child um, seems to need them or want them. They are motivated to taking care of their child's needs because it, think about the narcissist, it makes them feel good. And of course, in, in return, they love this child. And to an outsider, we know it's conditional love because we know that if the child should somehow react negatively or start to say no or start to behave in ways that embarrass the emotional manipulator, that love that that child was showered changes and goes away. <clears throat> Successful adaptation requires a child to learn the conditions, to respond quickly and accurately to the demands um, and the cues of, of the emotional manipulator. Alice Miller, who wrote the book, The Drama of the Gifted Child, had profound influence over me. It was, there are so many people who influence my ideas and my theories, and I try to give them all credit. <clears throat> but in her book, she postulated that we therapists become the way that we are because we were born to parents who were narcissists. And we learned early on to adapt, to make the parent feel good about themselves. Doing so set up, sent in mo set up in motion <clears throat> our approach to life, that we get love and attention when we make other people happy. Um, it is true that as early in infancy, a child can, knows what's going on outside of him or herself and can adapt to the personality of their parent. This child learns to respond quickly and accurately to this narcissist's cues or demands, to develop a radar to detect the EMM's moods, <clears throat> to be hypervigilant, to be able to predict the EMM's moods, to avoid their triggers at all costs or rage because doing so staves off neglect, abuse, and abandonment and garners them this conditional love. So coping creates codependency skills. To learn how to be the pleasing child, to be a superb actor, to pretending to be happy when not, to, be ex to become experts at delaying their own needs for gratification, to control, to suppress, and to sublimate their emotions, because anger and sadness can trigger the emotional manipulator, which can cause a narcissistic injury that can result in danger or harm to the child. This child has so much at stake to maintain the identity of the fantasy child persona because she gets the attention. And she also notices, whether she's six months old or four years old, that when people say no to the narcissist, bad things happen and they're terrified, and they learn to mold their personality in a way to make that narcissist happy. They comply with unnatural expectations. They learn to be calm when frightened, happy when angry, lovable in unlovable situations. The very seeds of codependency are being planted by this child's ability to adapt to the emotional manipulator. They blend into their environment. They're like chameleons, they, they sense what they need to be, and they become that person to get the love and attention that they need and to keep from becoming the object of anger or embarrassment. This child, who's going to eventually become codependent, grows up with what I call premature maturity. They develop self-esteem around their abilities to be the caretaker for adults and children, to remain calm in a crisis, to reflexively sacrifice, to listen when wanting to talk, to controlling their own risky emotions and responses, to behave as an adult before their time. They sacrifice or have to sacrifice their childhood to make the EMM happy. The psychological damage done to these children is severe and profound. As a child gets older, the child, um, the child parents the EMM. There's a role reversal. Early on, this child is rewarded with their caretaking nature. It's as if the child um, has a relationship with their parent where they learn to manage their parents' emotions because they learn that's how they stay um, from their parents' wrath, depression. This child learns to bolster their parents' confidence as a way to get the love that they need. This child might even um, strive for early independence, become an adolescent, not because they were raised with that as, a, as, a, as an ideal, 
but, because, but just like Billy Frechette, to take care of their parent who can't take care of them. They become expert listeners, patient, forgiving, compassionate. They're the trophy child. They become the kid that provides the EMM with bragging rights. So we talk about the emotional manipulator's relationship with the, code, the child who's going to be codependent. It's unhealthy. It's enmeshed. And we know about sexual incest, which is, of course, in this case, a parent who cannot meet their sexual needs with an adult partner will turn to their child and the, to meet their sexual needs um, and cause grave trauma and psychological damage, but not really think about the child's um, safety because they're all about their own needs. <clears throat> and we know stories about that. But emotional incest can be as bad. The, 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 the emotional manipulator that needs the child to make them feel good relies on this child to meet their emotional needs, a powerless child who doesn't have boundaries. See, the narcissist cannot have, or is unable to have emotional relationships with adults because we know that they're unable. And so they might, um, they might always be fighting and arguing or in conflict with other people, but they'll turn to this powerless child to make themselves feel good about themselves, to meet, to meet their own needs. This child becomes their best friend, in a way their pseudo spouse. This is hugely damaging. And we call this um, emotional incest, where the child sacrifices her own feelings of safety, her own reality of needing to someone to take care of her needs or his needs in order to take care of the adult. It's a role reversal um, that has profound consequences in their psychological development. So the results then um, is, is this person, this child, grows up into an adult who loves those who love them conditionally who is selfless in, selfless in relationships, who is reflexively others-oriented, who denies their own needs, who feels safe and familiar with selfish and self-centered people, who rescues people from their feelings, who's proud and determined with their selflessness, who bends reality with ease. They believe in such statements as selflessness and sacrifice are virtues, happiness and personal safety require sacrifice. A good person doesn't require much. It's selfish to ask for what you want. It's needy to ask what you want. Our self-reliance is an asset. This perfect child becomes a perfect spouse, the perfect friend, the person who stuffs their feelings, or the expert pretender, or the great pretender. in a world of my own, I play the game to my real shame. You've left me to dream all alone. Too real is this feeling of make-believe, too real when I feel what my heart can't conceal. Oh yes, I am the great pretender, just laughing and gay like a clown. I seem to be what I am not, you see. I'm wearing my heart like a crown. Too real when I feel what my heart can't conceal. Today I am going to ruin two or three songs for you. This song used to be the song that I used to listen to. My mom loved 50s music, and it was a wonderful melody and tune. And one day I actually listened to the lyrics, and I said, oh, my gosh, this is a song written by a codependent. And what a song of personal sacrifice and pain. So this child who was born to an emotional manipulator that learns to adapt by pleasing learn, um, becomes an adult who accepts conditional love who justifies their actions through distorted beliefs, who sees good in abusive or harmful people, who mistakes abuse or neglect for love, who justifies abuse by distorting the meanings of loyalty and commitment and historical values. 